Brooklyn Independent Television. Straight ahead on Sector B, the business of Brooklyn. It was a total mess. When the hurricane hit Red Hook, one of its targets was Steve's famous key lime pie. One pie at a time, he's back in business. It's very time consuming. It's all hand formed, these larger ones, we do it by hand. Now, if only he could figure out the insurance. I don't have a clue what we're actually covered for. City Council member Dominic Recchia talks about rebuilding Coney Island and how the community needs to help a certain set of very hard workers. One group in particular that has been great working with us was the day laborers. In Bushwick, aquaculture meets hydroponics. What's that mean? It has to do with using a tank full of tilapia. The fish excretes ammonia as their form of waste. To grow produce. Nitrate is a perfect plant food. Someday soon, a lot of fish and this empty lot could be filling your salad bowl. Aquaponics is very much suited for urban areas and very much suited for areas that don't have good soil. And pop-up shops at Gowanus Grove, courtesy of Gowanus Girls. Good for the women in charge. So if that wasn't clear, that's one of the reasons that we founded the market. Got Samantha it. and I both love to shop. And good for local designers. You don't have enough stuff to open up a whole store. So to have like a little booth and you can test the market, that's been really good. So go ahead, buy something, and get with the program. Hello, I'm Randy Piers. Welcome to Sector B, the business of Brooklyn on Brooklyn Independent Television. Since Hurricane Sandy, communities have pulled together. Countless volunteers have given their time and energy. And on the small business side, thousands of small business owners have shown a determination to get up and running as soon as possible. All this selflessness in the face of difficulty has made it a bittersweet experience for Brooklyn. That's certainly true for one of Red Hook's most famous names, Steve, whose authentic key lime pies are also bittersweet, or better yet, tart. We were anticipating the hurricane arriving. Uh, we just didn't know to what degree. We took a few precautions, but no one was expecting uh, waist-high water. And we came back the following morning, and uh, it was a total mess. And Stuff was everywhere. Well, in addition, we, we, our power was out for 15 days, so all of our perishables were, were lost. See, these are, these are all, it's very time consuming. It's all hand formed, these, these larger ones, we do it by hand. Um, so that, when, when we lost all the product, because of the electricity, some of it got water damaged, but the electricity went out. Not only did we lose the product, but we lost the time that it took to, to pre-make all this stuff. We had one of our large freezers that was here. That's the one that got toppled over. That was just the water picked up. I found it laying on the, on the ground when it came in. But, but the, all the compressors, everything is up here, well out of uh, harm's way. And the, the water did encroach, so everything it was just soggy. It was this ugly mix of salt water and stuff. So we, we had to go through and clean out all the, all the freezers and again the product you can see how this is they're, they're all they're pretty much full um, so that was everything in the, the, the stand-up freezers was lost but it took a couple days to get powered up here in the meantime we uh, we drank a little bit um, just to get over the initial shock I moved in here as a wholesale bakery, and I'm primarily a wholesale bakery. So our focus initially was to get our wholesale business up and running. Our customers have been a month without the product. We were afraid we were going to lose some, and that's our bread and butter. Wolfgang's which one? Gotcha. What do you need? At this point now, I would say the, the first week uh, following uh, Thanksgiving, we, uh, we kind of hobbled back. We, we, we got deliveries out to some of our larger customers. And then the following week after that, we were back on track. You know, we're doing 
doing the regular deliveries. We, we lost one customer, which was, you know, for whatever reason. We'll get you 20 as soon as we can. Thank you. I would advise anyone listening to this the, to, number one, take advantage of the federal flood uh, insurance. The other thing as well is because, you know, we faithfully pay our insurance payments every month. I don't have a clue what we're actually covered for. I'm finding out now. But, you know, sit down and talk to your insurance agent. What else? Move to higher ground. Uh, <laughs> uh, we're going to stay here. Uh, what we will probably do is uh, build a little smarter so that uh, if, we, if we were revisited by high water, we're, we're going to build our walls up maybe three or four feet on cinder block and then run the, the sheetrock above that and run all the electric at a higher level. And make sure that as much of the equipment that we have uh, is out of the way. And if it looks like we're going to get hit with another storm like this, we will certainly get stuff to higher ground. Um, and uh, yeah, go home. If you're in an evacuation area, evacuate. Thank you. I appreciate it. Coney Island like so many other waterfront sections of Brooklyn, suffered severe damage from Hurricane Sandy. Here to give us the latest on the community's recovery and rebuilding is its New York City Council member and Finance Chairman, Dominic M. Recchia, Jr. And speaking of rebuilding, all the renovation going on locally has been a boon to one group in particular, the day laborers, most of them immigrants who do much of the heavy lifting. Joining us to talk about their situation is Ligia Guapa, Executive Director of the Workers' Justice Project. Council Member, let's start with you. Can you bring us up to speed on where the rebuilding is going? Well, the rebuilding is turning out that it is much tougher than the actual storm in dealing with the uh, actual devastation that Coney Island has been hit with. And uh, as the Council Member and working with all the other elected officials, we are desperately working hard, making sure that Coney Island Seagate, Brighton Beach, Manhattan Beach, moves forward and gets rebuilt immediately. And we've been starting with uh, working with the uh, homes. Seagate was devastated and the single homes. Uh, the NYCHA facilities are all up and running, but their uh, uh, boilers are all outside. They'll be out there for at least a year. And the families that live in the single-family homes, many of them have not even began the construction and the renovation of their homes. Many of them can't afford to hire people. Many of them have not received any money from either FEMA or their insurance companies. And the insurance companies are not working well with their customers. They're not treating them, especially Allstate. But as elected officials, we are stepping up to the plate. We're working hard. There are two good things that are, are happening. One good thing is today, Cantor Fitzgerald uh, is given out to PS90 in Coney Island and to PS329, two schools, elementary schools, a $1,000 credit card to every parent whose child attended the Coney Island school to help them get on with their lives. And they can use this money any way they seem fit for their families. The other good thing is that when we started this, we needed volunteers, all New Yorkers and Brooklynites especially, all came out to help in Coney Island and volunteering, especially the Roadrunners. They came out also uh, once they called off the marathon, and I want to thank uh, the mayor and Mary Wittenberg for that. But especially one group in particular that has been great working with us and working with the community that came out to volunteer was the day laborers, and Leha has come forward and they volunteer, and because of the volunteering, many people are hiring them to help them work in the renovation and the reconstruction of Coney Island. And it was a beautiful thing because the men and women all came out, but they just didn't come out to help to do the construction, the renovation, the demolition, but they also came out to organize us, giving out food, carrying water up flights of steps, and it was a lot of hard work. And I want to thank Leah for leading it and the uh, Bay Parkway uh, Job Center. We started this many, many years ago, 
and it's been doing an excellent job. So let's let's talk a little bit about the, the Bay Parkway Center before we talk about the day laborers in particular. What was the idea behind it and, and how does it work? So many years ago actually it started um, with a lot of support with very few and um, I just have to mention that the councilman um, has been one of the very few leaders in the community that really has stepped up and really recognized first the value that day laborers bring to the communities that they are not only workers but they're community members that live and work there and the idea behind it was to create a space to create to create a fair hiring process for contractors and homeowners that really need that labor to help out and uh, ensure that that process is, is a fair process, um, workers are, are earning a fair wage, are receiving the proper training, the health and safety. Um, and he was the councilman here and many other leaders um, in the community were not wrong. When this type of crisis came in our community, the day laborers were the first responders um, to do the cleanup. So day laborers don't have money to donate, but they said we have one of the most valuable assets, which is our labor. Now more than ever, our community needs, and we need to come out, and they're doing it, not only working, but as a councilman said, volunteering and offering that um, trained labor to the community. So, so how has the, the volume of day laborers increased since Sandy? What was it like before the storm, and what has it been more recently? So usually during the winter time, construction goes down. Um, because not many um, con construction companies do um, construction during the winter time. Um, the, during construction, there used to be few jobs. Now we're delivering five, six, up to like, at the beginning it was more than 20 jobs on daily basis to do the cleanup. Um, now we're, a lot of the workers are moving to the second phase, which is doing reconstruction, putting the sheetrock back, doing the tiling, doing the roofing. And this, we have acknowledged that this is the, the second phase of the reconstruction that needs a lot of more training, a lot of more skilled labor, and working on that along with the councilman to make sure that the first step is ensuring that the workers are receiving the proper health and safety. We conducted the first OSHA training, um, two different ones with more than 50 workers on each. Uh, we're gonna be doing an scaffold training also in Coney Island along with the councilman. Um, and now we're moving forward with local tent um, to hopefully that apprenticeship program will be approved um, uh, at the state level to ensure that the workers are receiving the proper training, that home, homeowners are receiving uh, a high quality uh, workforce. And why not? Ensuring that a lot of the construction for those homes that the councilman mentioned that cannot afford, that Bay Parkway has a hand there, a free labor, and also homeowners that can rely on, on, on labor that they can hire from them. So That's fantastic. The good thing about having this, uh, what we're trying to do here, we're trying to get all these day laborers off the corners yeah. in Brooklyn. We've been working on this, and uh, we're trying to get them in one location so contractors could come to one location, and they could get the proper people to hire for the day or for the week, okay, or permanently. For example, many people will go there. If they go, if they need a painter, you could go up and drive up, and walk into the office say, I need you know, two people, three people who know how to paint. And they will give you people who know how to paint, who have that skill, all right? When you go and hire someone off a street corner, which many people do, they say they know how to paint, but then you're not happy with the way they painted, and that's where the problems start. So the center basically sort of verifies that they have the appropriate skill level yes. for, the, for the job that's being asked for. Yeah. Right, and that's why we've been successful, but we have to. We have a lot more work on improving it. Yeah. Uh, we have to get more contractors to come to the center. Yeah. We have to get uh, more day laborers off the corners and to come here. Uh, one thing is that uh, they make sure is that the contractors have the proper safety uh, equipment for these workers. You and can't put training. people yeah. up on the roof if they don't have the proper harnesses and proper... And does the uh, center equipment. provide that? Um, now we're doing it. Um, we were able to get some um, funding through uh, foundations that really stand up, like Ford Foundation, Robin Hood Foundation. Workers have the alternative. If the employer is not providing or something happens, they have a harness 
they have a helmet, they have the gloves, the basic proper equipment. And one of the things that we are also doing is ensuring that a lot of the contractors knows the benefit of providing this type of, uh, of safety equipment because no contractor wants to get a violation with right. OSHA, the Department of Buildings, or have a job accident and suddenly gets you know, sued by so one the, of the So companies. the first preferred course of action would be to have the contractor provide that. But in the case that they can't, it's better to have people safe, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. We actually make the contract to sign a fair agreement. Right. One, that the worker commits that the job is going to be done uh, well and professionally, and also that the employer is going to provide um, the health and safety equipment and is going to pay a fair job. You know, during the uh, demolition of Coney Island, uh, when the day laborers uh, were volunteering, uh, they didn't have gloves or masks. So Councilman Gentili and myself, all right, uh, we obtained, you know, uh, he was in charge of gloves, I was in charge of the mask, <laughs> and we got them for the workers because we believe that they need the proper uh, equipment to do this work. Uh, but, you know, what a lot of people don't understand, they want to be part of our community. Yeah. They want to work with us, not against us. They want the fair jobs, fair paying jobs, and they, they're willing to do the work. So as we move forward in Coney Island, you know, with everyone working and rebuilding, it's just the beginning. We're working with rapid repairs, and uh, a lot of people uh, are complaining. What a lot of people do not realize is that uh, the, there was an overwhelming response to it. But you're talking about the rapid repairs. The program. rapid repairs program. But in all fairness, what a lot of people rapid repairs already did over four thousand homes as we sit here today in New York City. And that is a great accomplishment to a program where people get a free boiler, free heat, and hot water. We're heading in the right direction. There's a lot more work to be done. And if anyone has a problem or need help, please feel free to call my uh, office, either my district office in Brooklyn or my main office in Manhattan at 250 Broadway. We're here to help the people of Brooklyn. No matter where you live, we're going to help you. In a few seconds left, Lee here, what would be the next step for the center, in your opinion? What, what, where do you want to go from here? So our next step is actually um, uh, rebuilding the center because the center was only, I mean, it was impacted as well. Ah. Um, and thanks to Dominic Reckia, we got the space to reopen, to reclaim, and now we're going to work together yeah. to make sure the workers get a new facility, but also to call more contractors and homeowners that the center is there for them, and the center is open from 7 o'clock in the morning up to the noon. They can call to, to, to the phone number, which is 718-600-0425, and the workers are there. And, and this has probably been assumed, but I want to make sure that we clarify. There is bilingual staff, particularly Spanish-speaking staff, available yes. at the center. Spanish and English. Spanish and English. Very good. Well, listen, I want to thank you both. Uh, I am very sure that Coney Island and that whole area of Brooklyn will rebuild with strong leaders like you leading the way. So thank you both for being here. It's a pleasure to be here, and I just want everyone to know that Coney Island will definitely be open this summer. Here, here. Thank you. Two entrepreneurs working in Bushwick, urban farming, aquaponics, ammonia, nitrates, and tilapia? What's this all mean? We'll let Sector B Sherry Carabin explain. First time, yes, it is. Pretty nice. I thought it was a fish tank. <laughs> it's a common mistake made by many who shop at Bushwick's Moore Street Market. But in reality, the tilapia in this tank are providing food that will help grow chemical-free produce in the middle of this urban shopping area using the technique known as aquaponics. Uh, aquaponics is a hybrid of two different farming techniques. One is aquaculture, which is essentially fish farming, and the other is hydroponics. Crown Heights resident Jonathan Bowe is co-founder of Oko Farms. Together, he and his partner, East New York resident Yami Amu, completed the installation of this system at the Moore Street Market in November. We just started these. So actually, we just put the seeds in in a couple days, and you can see they're already starting to come out just slightly. We're taking edible fish like tilapia, perch, trout. Um, we're feeding them. The fish excretes ammonia as their form of waste. There are two different types of bacteria that break down that ammonia. The ammonia turns in from ammonia to nitrite. Um, and then there's the second bacteria which turns the nitrite into nitrate. Nitrate is a perfect plant food. So from there, uh, we have a pump at the bottom. 
that pump pumps the water all the way up to the top grow bed here. Um, from here, the water drains down into this grow bed. It uh, provides food for the plants, and it also cleans the water for the fish. Our goal with this specific system is just to demonstrate to people what aquaponics is on a small scale. While it is getting a lot of attention, it's only a preview of what's to come this spring when a much larger system goes up outside the market in this vacant lot. We were initially thinking about using this system as an educational system for people, but since we're going to have a bigger farm next door, the bigger farm is going to be the education system. It's not their first plunge into the world of aquaponics. The idea of starting an urban agricultural company has been in the works for a while. I've been gardening and teaching um, gardening and health education and nutrition education for about 10 years now. And I met Jonathan last year while I was working on a rooftop farm in Crown Heights. We did a small aquaponics system together and then decided, you know, a few months later that we wanted to make it bigger and um, possibly turn it into an actual farm and a business. Prior to their current endeavor, they set up smaller systems at several other locations in the city, including this coffee house on Franklin Avenue where basil and mint are already growing. The system really works. It really does work. A lot of people just walking the streets, they'll, be, they'll look into the coffee shop and then they'll see this and they're like, oh, what is that? So they go in and look and they read the poster and they ask us questions and people love it. And then they order coffee. So that's, you know, we reel them in like that. How much does one of these systems cost? I would say between five and $8,000. This is a handmade steel structure that was individually welded. So this is one of the more high-end ones. We can build systems for around $1,000. In addition to setting up systems, the company offers yes, classes that teach the basics of aquaponics. Would you say that aquaponics farming is especially helpful for those who do live in urban areas? Aquaponics is very much suited for urban areas and very much suited for areas that don't have good soil. With the hurricane and storms that we're going to be getting more and more, a lot of our soils are going to start becoming more and more um, dangerous for farming or growing food in. Aquaponics helps eliminate that. And you get fish, you get vegetables, and you get to grow three times as much food per square foot compared to dirt-based gardens. Pretty nice, we need something like that over here. It's sentiments like that that the owners are hoping to hear more of as they seek to expand their company even further. The business plan is always evolving. You know, right now we're really looking for sympathetic landlords who would like food grown on their spaces. Coffee. Yes. Reporting for Sector B, I'm Sherry Carabin. Pop-up shops are, well, popping up all over the place. And Sector B's Tati Amara tells us about one that happened just a few blocks away in Gowanus. It was devoted entirely to showing and selling the work of women designers and food entrepreneurs from Brooklyn. It's official, the pop-up shop craze has reached Brooklyn. And in Gowanus, there's a market with a unique focus. So really, the overarching theme is girls, design, and community. The market is an extension of the girls-only Curious Jane Camp, which focuses on science, design, and engineering. We thought Gowanus should have a market of its own. It's kind of ideally located between Park Slope and Carroll Gardens. And then we thought, how can we make it right for Curious Jane? And that's where the all-female twist came from. And the Gowanus Girls Market was born. Started by Melissa and her partner, Samantha Razuk Murphy, founder of Curious Jane. Everything about producing the market, which is a, has been a learning experience for us, has been very positive. Um, the vendors are excited about it. They're excited about being part of um, a market that highlights, you know, locally made, independent, female-owned, female-designed. So we wanted something that was going to serve the Gowanus area, draw attention to the Gowanus area as far as smart development, small businesses. You know, maybe someone will come here and say, oh, look at this cool community. I'm, I'm starting something myself. Maybe I'd like to be here. 
and they told me the Gowanus Grove, nestled by the canal, was their ideal location to convey this message. It's a magical spot, Gowanus Grove is, um, and it feels, you know, bucolic and peaceful and kind of treesy in the middle of industrial Brooklyn, so, um, so it's special and unusual in that way, and that's one of the things that was important to us when we were scouting spots to have the market. And the duo have made the mission a personal one. So this is Sarah with Love of Pretty who does wonderful um, beach-inspired designs. And I'm wearing a pair of her earrings actually right now. Very nice. <laughs> so you're not just so, one of the founders, you shop. When I shop, here too. oh yeah, no, that's what, if that wasn't clear, that's one of the reasons that we founded the market. Got Samantha it. and I both love to shop and, yeah. and do love pretty things. The market featured food, jewelry, clothing, and even new businesses making their debut. I learned about Gowanus Girls because I actually know Samantha and Melissa through Curious Jane and when I learned that they were going to be running Gowanus Girls I thought this might be a great opportunity for for Medities to actually get its launch so it was just the timing was was really lucky and jewelry designer Tiffany Burnett told me about the benefits of this kind of market for her business you know you have maybe a few things you don't have enough stuff to open up a whole store. So to have like a little booth where you have some of your stuff out and you can test the market and see what works and what doesn't, that's been really good. I mean, definitely cost effective for sure. Some businesses launched, others grew, and this vendor got to learn about unknown territory. I live in Fort Greene, so not too far away, but I had never come to Guanas before. Uh, and now there's so many cool shops and you're getting to experience more and meeting other people who like, can tell you great places to eat or you know other places to go it's been it's been amazing and that's been one of the things that's been really great about founding the market is you know not only seeing great things but meeting the people behind them and it's just been a great mix of people and community and kind of introducing right. great people to other great people and it's right. just been a really wonderful vibe and they'll continue that vibe with a monthly market starting this spring for sector b i'm tati amara That's it this month from Sector B. To watch any of these stories again and to see all of our past stories, go to our website at brickartsmedia.org BIT and then click on Sector B. And you could follow us on Facebook or Twitter on BK Independent TV. I'm Randy Piers. Thanks for watching. Watch this and other Brooklyn Independent Television episodes online at brickartsmedia.org slash BIT.